I'm excited to moderate today's panel titled Toward a Healthy Research Ecosystem for Large Language Models. Um, we brought together panelists from industry, academia, and government uh, to discuss the challenges and opportunities that are coming uh, to the fore with large-scale neural language models, uh, including topics in the core science, responsibilities with regards to societal influences, uh, and broadly on fostering a strong research ecosystem. Um, so please welcome our panelists, Ahmed Agbadala, Erwin Janshandani, Percy Liang, and Sarab Turi. Um, Ahmed uh, is a senior principal research manager in Microsoft Research, leading multidisciplinary efforts at the intersection of machine learning and natural language processing. His focus is on making large scale uh, uh, neural models more efficient and creating horizontal technologies that enable teams of scientists and developers to use large scale AI in practice. Erwin is uh, assistant director at NSF, where he leads the new and exciting directorate named Technology Innovation and Partnerships referred to fondly, I think, as TIP. Hopefully, the <laughs> acronym is okay. The top-level goals of the directorate has been to advance use-inspired and translational research. Um, Erwin has been very active in at NSF and in the sciences and science, science policy for many years. He served as the inaugural director of the Computing Community Consortium um, and then encouraged uh, the pursuit of bold, high-impact research directions like health information technology and sustainable computing. That's where I actually met uh, Erwin uh, as a CCC committee member. We had we had some intensively productive efforts there, and I've remained impressed by how much Erwin can do in scientific leadership. Uh, Percy Liang is an associate professor of computer science at Stanford. His research aims to make machine learning more robust, fair, and interpretable, and computers easy to communicate with through natural language. Percy is deeply interested in the opportunities and risks associated with foundation models and has truly been a leading spirit and intellect on the topic. Um, after the, um, the session, he'll actually be talking about um, some work uh, within the Turing Academic Program uh, projects uh, at Stanford. Sarab is a corporate vice president leading the Microsoft Turing Group, uh, which he founded in 2015. He's been a passionate and inspirational co-lead on this effort. MS TAP. Uh, Sarab's current focus is on scaling deep learning efforts to improve Microsoft products via, via large scale training, state of the art models for NLP and computer vision, and efficient inferencing across various different hardware architectures and platforms. So, with much to discuss, uh, let's just get started and dive right in with a few questions, and I'll aim at uh, individuals, but we'll have uh, open discussion as well as some broader questions. Um, so, so Percy, um, uh, there are several universities uh, here today with us at today's workshop, um, and, and you and I've discussed this actually just not too long ago. Uh, I'd love you to share your thoughts with the larger group. What do you believe? Um, uh, uh, how do you believe that, the, that, that you know how is the academic community uniquely qualified uh, to accomplish great things and uh, innovative work with large scale neural models? Um, you know, think about students and longer term projects and, and dissertations and so on, advising in teams. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And I just want to uh, express my gratitude for Eric for uh, launching um, this, uh, you know, TAP program. It's been really helpful for our research as for as many in the community as we'll uh, see later. I think, as we all know, these uh, large language models, but more generally foundation models, which includes multimodal models, are are just very impressive, but not only that, they are becoming kind of the, the infrastructure on which um, a lot of application society work. And what has happened is this increasing um, gap between industry and ac academia, which Eric alluded to. And I think one reaction that I often hear in academia is that also almost a sense of you know, hopelessness where you know, these models are so big that they're inaccessible and academics are, you know, some turn to other types of problems. But, but I think this is uh, a missed opportunity because in academia, there's such a wide range of different, you know, ideas and, um, and to programs such as this, I think serve the important function of actually drawing um, academics into the pertinent problems that are um, part of AI in, in society. Um, so I think this is, you know, a wonderful kind of step in in that direction. Um, 
more uh, substantively on the ways that academia could uh, function. One kind of, there, there are many things, I'll just list a few. One top level thing is that just the intellectual and uh, disciplinary diversity of academia is, is something that is, uh, is very, very important, especially when studying societal impacts of this technology. I think traditionally, um, you know, companies uh, and, and also computer science departments have been focused on more the technical uh, side of these, these technologies, but it's, uh, it's obvious with all of the, the issues with bias and toxicity and disinformation that um, a much holi more holistic view is needed. And what academia offers and what we've been doing at um, the Center for Research on Foundation Models at Stanford um, is drawing in people from all over campus, economists, legal scholars, political scientists, social scientists, and to really think about all the different aspects of these technologies. So I think that's one thing that academia um, can do. The second is um, the fact that academia exists as a sort of a third part, neutral third party in some sense, right? Without uh, commercial incentives, I think it allows us to do certain types of work, um, which just can't be done in, in industry in the same, with the same effect. Um, for example, as I'll uh, tell you later, we've been working on a um, benchmarking project where we're looking at across both the Turing models, but also models from other uh, companies and um, you know, assessing and comparing and contrasting. And I think that the effect of that is would be very different if, for example, a Microsoft or Google came out with a paper that said we compared all, all the different models. So there's certain types of work that almost have to, by kind of their legitimacy or validity, have to be done um, you know, outside. Um, uh, maybe a final thing is, um, you know, in academia, we often think about kind of the longer term issues, which might not be on the forefront, right? I think if most of what I see uh, in kind of getting these, these um, language models um, and foundation models out right now is dealing with issues of you know, toxicity, because that's kind of an immediate thing. If you're generating hate speech, then um, that's going to not a, be a very good experience. But I think there's many more longer term and more subtle Things, for example, you know, bias, um, which are hard to hard to measure, and I think a lot of it needs to be. Um, we need a better framework for thinking about these things. But also, we've been looking at um, issues of homogenization, which is more of a um, kind of a holistic. What happens when all the models and all the applications are driven from a very small core, um, and how does um, the use of these models, which could basically mediate all human communication and creation, you know, in a few years, how does that change our you know, society in kind of deeper ways? And that's something that I think academia could spend uh, a great deal of time um, kind of thinking about, which isn't really the concern maybe of the next uh, year or so. And, and there's, there's more, but I, I think I'll maybe stop there just to uh, end with uh, some ideas. Well, thanks. Uh, and then all, all provocative and interesting. Erwin, um, an important part of your role at NSF, my point of view, is a driving collaboration across the NSF and other government agencies, industry and academia. How do you envision these organizations coming together to help foster a stronger AI research ecosystem for the nation? Can you hear me OK, Eric? Yeah. A little choppy, okay, but good. Yeah. OK, I'm working off of an a, a unfortunate internet connection, but so we'll do the best we can. Yeah, so, the, the, uh, the, one, the one unfortunate part is that um, I think your, your video is maybe like minutes uh, behind your, your audio, but the audio is great. Yeah, so, yeah. so maybe I'll just I'll just uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll turn off my camera so you can focus on the audio. <laughs> That's just, probably a good idea. Um, and minutes was an overstatement. So, it's second. It's seconds. OK, <laughs> so. Um, so first of all, I think that, uh, so, so Eric, thanks for your leadership here and thanks to, to everyone else at Microsoft and throughout the community for that matter, who's really been leading on this front. I think this is an incredibly important 
uh, uh, effort that 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 you all really are front and center on. Um, and it's a privilege and a pleasure to be a part of this panel this this morning as well. Um, so in terms of um, my role at NSF, so you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, in the time that I was in my previous role in the computer science director at NSF, and now the time that I've been in this role leading this newly established TIP Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate, you know, we've really been trying to emphasize partnerships between industry and academia across the board, um, and government too, for that matter. Uh, and we see it as a means by which we can not only uh, bring a shared set of resources those could be dollars, those could be test beds, those could be data sets, those could be toolkits, but a shared set of resources to bear, but also help shape sort of the research problems that we're trying to tackle as well. Um, and so I think that in this particular case, uh, these partnerships, as, as Percy was alluding to in his remarks, the partnerships between industry and academia really allow us to be able to open up these models to the research community. And I think that that is so critical, right? Uh, I mean, you talk about in the title of this panel, toward a healthy research ecosystem for large language models. And so I see partnerships that make available existing models for the academic research community as as key and partnerships that provide resources for the development of new models or research purposes for that matter as really the foundational element when we think about a healthy research ecosystem for large language models. Um, I think that we in government have a role to play here as well. So, um, you know, Percy hinted at the opportunity for research questions in terms of better understanding model behavior and embedded biases in terms of identifying flaws and biases in developing mitigation measures. Um, thinking about how we can develop effective auditing and evaluation mechanisms, uh, thinking about privacy protection. And I can't stress enough, you know, in much of what I just described, those, those areas, um, this is a socio-technical problem. It's not strictly a technical problem. Um, and so as I think about that and as I think about the role that government has to play to try to bring academia and industry together, um, you know, I think it's really about a commitment to uh, reach the full breadth of talent across the country, located some in industry, but a lot in academia as well, and bringing folks to the table to being able to conduct the research efforts that I just described. And then there's the workforce piece too. I mean, I think it's really, really important that we train the next generation workforce around um, some of the uh, challenges with large language models. Um, how do you build better large language models in the future? How do you guard against some of the ways in which they can be exploited and so forth? I mean, there's a training aspect here, which academia is, of course, front and center on that I think is really, really important. Um, and maybe one other thing that I'll say that, that you know full well, Eric, and others on this call know too, to some degree. Um, we've been out of the National Science Foundation for the better part of the last year and a half, laying a groundwork to do some of what I just described, some of what you're doing, through something called the National AI Research Resource. Um, so this is a congressionally mandated activity where the idea is, what is the national sort of cyber infrastructure? That might be data, that might be computation, that might be test beds, that might be these large language models. What is the national scale cyber infrastructure that we need to stitch together to be able to really democratize access to what you need to be able to fuel AI research of the future? Um, and so I think in many ways, what you're describing here, right, and the efforts being undertaken here, they really oh, allow, they can really easily be plugged in to the uh, concept of a national AI research resource where these large language models could be yeah. accessible. Uh, thinking about this from the, from the lens of an ecosystem, I think that the large language models fit into that broader cyber infrastructure that can help fuel the next generation of discovery and innovation in the AI space. Um, and so, um, again, I think that uh, my perspective from a, a federal government standpoint is that we need to do more of this type of work to be enriching the collaboration and really, again, I'll use the word I used earlier, democratizing access to these types of resources for individuals at all different types of institutions and organizations who have all different types of perspectives because as we know that diversity is so critical at the end of the day when we think about um, how do we uh, become aware of even and then guard against biases yeah. and other kinds of challenges. Let, let, me, let me push you a bit. Uh on what I think is a fairly large elephant in the room. Um, when, when I sat down with a close colleague, a leader, the leader at Microsoft, and we competed back of the envelope, 
what it costs to build some of the largest models that we've been building. Um, a single model and its maintenance is kind of like investing and in building the Large Hadron Collider, single model. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so how did, it's, does our nation realize the scale and the need if we're going to for that nationally added resource to really move this forward? Uh, what it's going to take is what do you see? Like, how can we really make this happen for the the community? And what does it mean in terms of how we even select problems to to, to build and run uh, as a nation? Yeah. So Just, that, and, and, and I realize and I realize you'll be speculating because this is a process yeah. with the NAIR that's sort of in process with with the nationally added resource discussion. Yeah. 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 Um, no, but I, it's a very fair question, Eric. And and I think that my my answer to that question is. I think that the nation is is getting to a point, and I think that that leaders in Congress and the administration and so forth are getting to the point where there is an appreciation for the importance of this from a national competitiveness, but a national security and a national economic competitiveness standpoint. Uh, I mean, let's just you know now I'm going to um, uh, move away from uh, large language models for just a second and give you kind of a, a, a very related uh, anecdote. So. The National Science Foundation, as some of you know, has been around for 70 plus years. Um, Congress authorized it in 1950 via the NSF Act. Um, in that time, we've created directorates, we've transitioned directorates or units within the agency focused on specific topic areas. Um, the, 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 there's only one other directorate other than Technology Innovation and Partnerships TIP that's been codified in statute, codified in law by Congress. Um, and that's the Education Human Resources Director. But a few a few months ago in August, the president signed a bill that essentially authorized NSF to establish this director for technology innovation and partnerships. And it authorized Congress. Now, authorizing isn't the same thing, Eric, to your point, as appropriations, as actual money, but it authorized Congress to come back around and give to the foundation $36 billion more for R and D over the next five years. Right? And so I use that. Why do I say that? I'm not trying to brag about the new directorate. I'm, I'm actually make, trying to make the point that I think we're at a stage where our congressional leaders, our political leaders, appreciate that this is a national, you know, investment in AI, investment in key technology areas, and the ecosystem that we're trying to create, and the values that we bring to the table as a nation in the creation of that ecosystem and the development of new research outputs. That in fact, that actually is key to national competitiveness. So I can't speak to a large hadron collider, but I can tell you that I think there's a growing <laughs> appetite for serious investment in the R and D and the infrastructure that it's going to take to support that R and D and the workforce development. But to your point, you're right. Time will tell. We're going to see how the next few months pan out. The mayor task force, the task force charged by Congress with developing a plan for this AI resource that would be integ integrative of the large language model community, I hope. Um, the final report is due in December, um, and we will see what the reception to that final report is. Yeah. I will tell you the reception to the interim report in uh, June, which spoke to the need for a mayor, the how and the, and the what, was actually very, very favorable. Yeah, it, it hit me after looking at the end report that I, I, I just wondered if industry might put a couple of like budget numbers in as examples uh, to help Congress think this through. But anyway, but with, with, I, I'm very hopeful. Thanks for your for your uh, frank answers and and insightful uh, uh, guidance on moving forward. Let me let me move to Sarab. Uh, Sarab, you've been like I, I would say the the key spirit behind the direction and the production of Microsoft's largest um, uh, neural models. What must we consider today um, from your point of view in research and engineering to prepare for what's coming with uh, our sense for the increasing scale of the models? And that's, you know, the idea that you know, scale is not going to go away. This is going to be a continue, continuing march towards bigger scale, I think, unless there's some uh, surprising breakthrough in, at this point. Yeah, I mean, the way I think about it is uh, and i think you already by the way let me start with just thanking all the participants over here like uh, i think and also to you eric for kicking off this program uh, when we started it in very early days we weren't sure like how much will be the adoption etc where the tent tents will hold and and so on but it seems like it is becoming more and more like pertinent that what we kicked off is kind of like relevant in this space 
um, if we have to extrapolate into the future, kind of my feeling is that, um, and as Percy mentioned, that there is a worry in the academic community that like this is only an industrial kind of like an arms race and maybe academia doesn't have a role to play. I feel it may go along the similar direction as how the semiconductor and fab business has gone, meaning if you think about today, all the um, ecosystem relating to e-commerce and connectivity and communication, etc., it's all driven by semiconductors, right? There's a lot of research happening, but if you look at the fab business, right, there are only very few players. The cost of building a fab is like on the order of 100, 200 billion dollars, etc. So you, not everyone can do it. But still, there's a lot of research going on, lots of downstream applications which are going on, which make it valuable and viable uh, to keep on funding the, the core aspect of like manufacturing chips, right? I feel the, the large scale models may go along that same way. I mean, already we are kind of along those trend lines. And as you said, this uh, the LHC and the cost of, <laughs> of spending uh, dollars on the order of LHC, uh, which is there. Uh, but I think this may continue. Obviously, uh, as more and more people contribute into this area, there is a lot of efficiency wins. Uh, what if you if I just continue taking my semiconductor analogy, right? Um, if people had extrapolated from like they were actually uh, even conferences where they were projecting that, OK, the chip may have so much compressed power that it may the temperature may rise beyond the surface of surface temperature of the sun and so on. Right. But there's a lot of uh, uh, insights and technical innovation which came in why chips are still being manufactured. The Moore's law is kind of stalling, but still kind of like progressing, maybe at a slower rate, uh, etc. Uh, so I I think on the on the model side as well. Uh, if you talk today, there are lots of limitations which may come in. Uh, cost being one, data being another one, uh, capabilities, etc. Do things saturate at some point or not, and and those type of things. But I think the the research community. Um, if they participate, and I think there is a real need for participation, I think this push and this new capabilities which are being powered by these uh, large scale uh, deep learning models, right? I think that progress will probably continue. And, and I think it needs a lot more partnerships and, and participation uh, as well in this direction. So I'm I'm pretty bullish in this, in this area. We, we have to be. Yeah. I think there'll be some interesting magic coming out of these models, even even more than we've seen so far as we continue to push. So, so your team now uh, uh, co-manages the MSTAP efforts and has played a major role, I would say, in, in the success of the program and getting it off the ground. What which, um, delighted you the most about the program? What surprised you about it? Now that we're moving into the second year, um, what would you say? You know, what have been the successes and the challenges? And I guess as part of that, just a bigger question. What do you want to see as we go into phase three moving forward? So uh, I would say, I mean, one of the one of the things which has surprised me is the wider adoption of the program. If you remember, Eric, we came out with the call for proposal or uh, invitation for proposal, not really call for proposal uh, because we wanted to uh, target them. Uh, but as we have talked to more and more universities, there's a lot of growing interest uh, in, in this program. Uh, as well as during the phase one and phase two, the part program itself has grown. Um, I think even the internal company support uh, relating to this has been uh, pretty decent, I would say. Um, it, was, it, was, it was great to see, uh, we have, uh, I don't know if Saurabh didn't mention this, but at a briefing uh, that's, that, that Saurabh gave to our senior leadership, uh, Satya paused and he said, let me, let me hear more about this program, our CEO, yeah. and, and uh, Saurabh did a great job representing it, and it was very exciting to the, to the Microsoft leadership. Yeah, so so all of those have been pretty exciting. Also, obviously the work, that's why we kicked off the program. So the, the research work which is happening uh, under the program is very exciting. There are uh, quite a few papers which are coming up as uh, we are maturing. Uh, in terms of uh, challenges, obviously uh, a lot of the liaison work which happens is a volunteer based effort uh, for people who don't re realize it. I mean, people uh, who are at the liaison also have their day jobs. Um, and uh, as part of that, um, like research com community is fairly demanding, right? Uh, it's not uh, like here is an op API, go ahead, right? There is a lot of requests about like, can we do this? Can we do that? Uh, and, and things like that. 
um, and we have to learn and grow and kind of like build what are the generic capabilities which can be uh, offered to many, many uh, teams. Um, so those type of things we have been kind of like developing as we go along, as happens with any kind of like uh, research engage engagement. Uh, and some of you who are uh, in this call probably are, are part of and have, uh, have felt that. Uh, we are also kind of like maturing, uh, but I would say when we started, it was, uh, well, we have some models and how people would be using them right but there are lots of additional capabilities and resilience and stability and and, and those type of things that we have to uh, have had to work through i would say uh, for phase three um, there are few uh, axes that i think we would like to push on um, one is more towards broadening the program uh, obviously it is an international program right now but making it like much more broader in terms of like various areas or regions in the world which are not represented today uh, as, as as participants in the program, right? So we want to uh, extend it uh, further. Uh, there are certain areas where we would like to encourage um, research. It doesn't mean that those areas don't have research today, uh, but uh, within the context of the program itself. So, for example, uh, multilinguality uh, is an is an area um, where relatively, I would say. Uh, there could be a lot more progress which could happen. Uh, I mean, one of the key attributes that I feel uh, with deep learning and AI is that it can kind of, like the, we have this phrase, right, that the future is here, it's just that even it's not evenly distributed, right, something like that. I think deep learning can make it evenly distributed uh, to a certain extent and the capabilities are there. There isn't an argument earlier, the argument used to be cost and, and kind of like ROI kind of, kind of things. I think there is uh, research which could really push along that particular axis. Uh, the other one is that uh, even though our our generative model, the the TNLG V2, has been the uh, the most used model as part of the program, like up to uh, I think approximately seventy percent of our university collaborators uh, leverage that. Uh, but one area which I hope uh, people would look into and pick up is. Uh, compression of generative models, uh, which includes like general purpose compression, meaning the model still keeps all its core capabilities while being a lot more efficient. Like these are the ones which are really, really large. And the other one is uh, along the axis of task specific capabilities, right? So can we compress it quite a bit while keeping certain aspects of the those generative models, right? And then I would say maybe the, the, the third axis is uh, basically, research on emergent, these are super hard problems, uh, but uh, research on emergent behavior and metrics. I know Persis team has been uh, working on metrics, but like emergent behavior is an axis which hasn't been thought about in classical machine learning because those things haven't really shown up. And nowadays, if you look at the, the models, actually the emergent behavior is the most attractive piece. Sure, they can beat benchmarks and stuff, uh, but the emergent behavior of like, oh, you can do things like you can ask something to write a joke, which was there's no benchmark for uh, for that. But I'm just using joke as an example, but like many, many different uh, capabilities uh, which are uh, that are there and the benchmarks are kind of getting saturated. Uh, so if you look at a lot of the leaderboard, um, which is there, you need to do a lot of custom things to move up the leaderboard while the models are getting a lot more powerful like and people just believe in them, right? Because they are able to do real production work and, and, and real world applications. So like those three accesses is, is, is what I would say for phase three. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for your, all your insights. I have to say that as you were talking, uh, I love this notion of, and I think it's really critically important of jumping from uh, metrics, which are almost by definition designed to understand the previous version of yes. the capabilities that we understand well to emergent phenomena where you see a qualitative jump in capabilities that you don't even have metrics for because you don't haven't thought deeply about it and you don't have a way of describing clearly semantically what the jump is exactly longer term inferences a planning kind of mentality coming up um you know people probably know we have a program at microsoft we call laser uh that, that so we bring people in from across the company and it's aimed specifically at looking at emerging capabilities and sort of understanding and coming up with the characterizations and a company's point of view on them. Uh, and I think I, I certainly think that that's uh, an important direction. So that particularly picked my interest just now. Uh, but but I, I enjoyed all your comments, uh, Sirab. 
So turning to Ahmed, uh, you know, Ahmed, you're you're in a unique position. You're you're a, a lead researcher at Microsoft Research. Um, uh, you work directly with the Turing team on the models as an internal person, um, without mean, meeting it like a TAP program, for example. But you also collaborate with people with external partners in Microsoft um, in in the Turing Academic Program. Um, so what what are some of the key technical challenges you found in working with large scale uh, language models? And then I'd love to hear about some of your favorite projects as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, so uh, as everyone was saying, the, the pace of advancement in large models have been amazing to witness. And the progress even seems to be accelerating and outpacing expectations in so many ways. Uh, in addition to that, even the cycle of moving these models into product experiences and these product experiences actually showing adoption and user value has been much faster than anything that I have seen over many years in Microsoft. And I think I think this is a very exciting time and there are a lot of opportunities, but there is also a lot of challenges uh, that we should be thinking about along the lines of how do we make sure that we can bring the benefits of these models to more people, to more experiences, while also mitigating risks and unintended outcomes. Uh, the point around emergence that, that Saurabh was referring to is actually one of the most exciting things to think about right now, uh, both from the perspective of emergent abilities and emergent risks. Uh, how, how do you actually identify these emergent abilities? How do you measure these emergent abilities? But also, if the model is having emergent behavior, uh, that will also mean that it can be used in ways that you did not expect. Uh, that also means that it will come up with risks that you don't really see. And when you can see and you can measure uh, something, it's pretty hard to, to mitigate it. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the technical challenges that I am personally very passionate about, uh, there are a couple actually. One of them is, is efficiency. Uh, I'm, I'm always a big fan of any work that works in the efficiency space along compression and other uh, directions as well. But I think we, we can and we should uh, think about ways of getting more out of these models with less cost and less compute. Uh, the compression is definitely one of the ways to get there, but there are also other things like right now, when you think about these models, we apply the full computational power of the model every time for every task, for every input, for every scenario. Uh, could there be more ways that are more adaptive where we can actually adaptively decide how much compute are we spending for a given task, for a given input, so that we can bring the cost down and increase the adoption of these models, bring them to more people more often. Uh, another challenge is the notion of adaptability and in general, how do we actually use these models? Like I think we are and we have been moving over the last year yes. plus maybe uh, from the perspective of retrain the models and fine tune the model on a, a, a task specific data and then deploy the model. Now we are thinking of the models as the models can do so many tasks out of the box so without even any fine tuning. And that opens the door for so many more scenarios, but at the same time, it uh, actually calls for more and more work on thinking about how do we adapt these models, how we adapt them to uh, personal data, personal knowledge, uh, how do we uh, adapt them over time, uh, how do we continually to learn and improve with the model, especially if we start thinking of it as a foundational model, maybe we don't want to touch the foundation layer, but we want to build on top of that. Uh, such that we can adapt and improve the model over time without having to retrain uh, the underlying foundation and model every time. Uh, the, the last area that I'm uh, really excited about is that we uh, the, the type of tasks and experiences that the models are enabling right now are moving beyond just classification and ranking and recommendation uh, to areas around creation and generation. And, and with creation, it will always be a co-creation problem where the human and the model are working together. And I think this notion of making the models more collaborative, figuring out the best ways for the human and the model uh, to work together, we are seeing a lot of advances there, even in the way the models are being trained and used uh, by instructions and prompts. But I think there's a lot more that we can do there. And specifically also thinking about how can we redesign the models uh, in ways that make them more collaborative, more interactive uh, by nature. Uh, in, in terms of the favorite applications or favorite projects, uh, I think uh, one of the most exciting things I have seen actually uh, lately and got the chance to do a little bit of work with is the Copilot project, the GitHub Copilot project. And I'm a big fan of Copilot and like many others, uh, at, at the beginning when I first heard about it, I was actually a bit skeptical uh, because I have seen a lot of work <laughs> on natural language to code and I understood from all of that work how hard the problem is. And then uh, with Copilot, 
uh, it has been doing an amazing job. And not only that, it's doing that with multiple programming languages. It's actually the, 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 the base it moved from research into production into adoption has been amazing uh, to witness. And I think it will really open the door to so many other applications and uh, models assisting humans in writing codes and other types of engineering tasks. And also it has been amazing to see how much it has been improving over time. Like since it, it uh, went out in preview and then went out in GA, there has been so much fast iteration on making the models better and better by understanding how uh, our pe people are actually using it and leveraging that information uh, in order to uh, in order to improve the model. Well, thank, thanks, Ahmed. Yeah, very interesting insights. Let me, um, uh, we have a few minutes left. I'll open it up to everybody now and just throw, throw a couple of questions. I'm going to share a, 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 one of my curiosities, and I'd love to hear your your insights about this and your speculations. I think we'll have to be speculations at this point. Um, will we see breakthroughs in our core uh, interests and goals in computational intelligence coming largely via scale? Just make things bigger, make things bigger and bigger. Uh, and then watch for emergence popping out of the, the the bigness in magical ways that we might, as humans might not even understand uh, the the models through the optimization processes are discovering with scale, or do we need breakthroughs at foundations with architecture, neural architecture search, you know, for example, developing new fundamental understandings to guide where we go, besides just you know turning bigger and bigger cranks. Uh, thoughts from anybody, and just feel free to just jump in. Uh, and uh, if, if if more than one jump in, we'll use hands. I can maybe start with that. Yeah, go go for it, Percy. Scale has always been a thing that people have talked about, right? In the in the you know uh, before it was uh, you know all you need is nearest neighbors and do <laughs> if you have enough data, and now it's all you need is attention if you have enough data. <laughs> So I think we've kind of seen this before. And what happens at is at each of these transitions, it's suddenly people realize that scale gives you a lift, but you know, we're not done um, yet. I think you get a lot farther with uh, this latest generation of models than you did with nearest neighbors, obviously. So no matter where you are, scale definitely will increase. Uh, um, I, I think there's many other dimensions. The importance of data is something that is extremely important as uh, you know, everyone I talk to, sort of doesn't really, I mean, everyone who's trains one of these models knows the importance of this, but it's not really talked about, uh, the data quality, what you train on. Um, also, uh, if you're doing instruction tuning, learning from human preferences, that can help a lot with the quality of the model as we've seen. Um, you know, the, the for example, before we thought OpenAI had these scaling laws and you need to just go bigger. And then the Mind Chinchilla paper shows that actually, well, you can have a much smaller model um, uh, their 60 billion um, parameter model actually outperforms their a model that was four times larger by just having more data. And so, was, and you know, one of the other things that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Chris Ray, has been doing is you know the prompt decomposition, where he's been able to show that you know with a six billion parameter model, if you prompt it in the right way, you can you know compete with even a 175 billion parameter model. So I think the the you know the things. Yeah, I think two years ago, there was sort of this emphasis on scale, 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 but I think um, people realize that there are many, many dimensions that uh, need to be explored. And, and this is really exciting from a research perspective. It would be very boring from a research perspective, maybe from an engineering <laughs> perspective, maybe that's a blessing or something, but from a research perspective, it's actually really exhilarating that there's so many dimensions. But I think scale is very important for one reason is that if you work at smaller scales, you want to make sure you're relevant. And so what I always think about every day is, you know, is the research I'm doing, is it going to be obviated by GPT-4 when it comes out, right? And there's many things you can do, like you can prompt hack and do all these things that it just won't matter for the next generation of models. So that's, I think, the important why this, this program and having access to large models is important so that you are aware of where the frontier is and make intelligent decisions about what to work on that aren't going to be obviated by scale, but there's many other directions that um, won't be. Very, very, very eloquent. Uh, any other thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I mean, I would. Yeah, I, I mean, I would 
uh, say that it's like, for example, this large models, right? Uh, generally, as humans, we want to like abstract things uh, and say, oh, large and like not interesting that you <laughs> and maybe for people who are not in the field of uh, like training them, it could be like, oh, I'm just changing this parameter uh, from like a hundred to a thousand and, and, and press a button and boom, uh, like you out comes a model uh, kind of a thing. Uh, there is a lot of like for uh, even in the in the training space, right? There is a lot of innovation which is which is coming up, um, obviously from like places like Nvidia and other uh, other other places, uh, including Deep Speed, which is a sister team uh, within uh, within Microsoft um, that that we have. Um, so in order to even make some of these things feasible, I think there is a lot of research etc. which is happening. Now one. One thing which scale offers, which is this predictability uh, that, oh, yes, there is a lot of uncertainty, but if we do this, generally the quality will improve. And that's why like industry is kind of leveraging it because an industry wants to de-risk a lot of the research aspects, et cetera. So they are like, oh, at least if we push along this, there is some predictable level of like quality improvements or new capabilities, et cetera, that might show up. But at some point, these will start hitting saturation limits. And as Percy was referring to, like data is becoming a lot more critical. I don't think you can just like collect, like scavenge from the internet and put something in and and and, and it will be, the model will be as good or competitive as, as things which are even out there or things which are happening uh, as well. So I think there is a lot of research and innovation which will, which needs to happen if we were to keep on pushing this front frontier. I don't think just uh, like the equivalent of changing a parameter is going to address uh, that particular uh, problem. And as I was saying, like if in order to make this accessible across the world, I don't think the 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 scale at which these models are right, they would be you would be able to run inference for the billions of people to provide the benefits that we have today, right? So there is that access as well, which is really critical to think about. And when you say the last part, so for, for the last, uh, oh, Erwin, you have a comment? Uh, I, well, I was just going to very quickly weigh in and, and maybe echo. Sure, and I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. Um, so, so I think what we're all saying a little bit is there's a degree of balance that's required here as we think about um, where intelligence is going to come from in the future, right? So, and as a funder, I see that balance sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, there, there's the fundamental research investment that one needs to make that in some sense can give rise to the next generations of scale down the road. So I think that um, the only point that I'll make very briefly is balance is really key. And that balance is also key, again, not just from a research standpoint in terms of the new AI innovations, but also in terms of from a workforce standpoint, how do we train our students to be thinking through both the dimension of fundamental research and how you scale can also be helpful in this context. Uh, Maybe uh, add a quick comment to, to yeah, to, please, to please, that, please, I think. Please, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, to uh, uh, scale is probably likely to remain one of the key areas of investment. Maybe not the only area of investment, but uh, if you look at the scale, and I think to to Percy's point, a scale it wouldn't only be about the number of parameters in the model. Like using more data, which necessitates using more compute to train the model, will definitely be another area where a lot of scaling work will happen. And also the shift toward building sparse model where you can actually increase the size of the model significantly without uh, increasing the amount of uh, uh, compute needed to train it. Uh, that sparsity is likely to be part of the story around scale. And I think the other thing is that this notion of emergent abilities where the model is starting to show behavior only at a certain level of a scale will motivate a lot of people to continue to push uh, to scale further to try to understand how far this can get us. And while we're on that topic, um, and we're coming to the close of our session, um, and I, I thought I would just ask, will we see emergence showing up? Uh, and we have, we can go back in history and look look at various emergent phenomena. Um, how can we better understand, especially with scale, how can we understand the foundations of what happened, um, what's going on, let's say with scale, that led to the emergent behavior? Do we have the, the appropriate tools and methodologies for even understanding, for example, jumping capabilities qualitatively? Any thoughts on that? I think it's an important direction to go in to, on this idea of transparency and probe of these models, especially with the emergent issues. Yeah, I can jump in. 
Yeah. I think this is the key question. And it's the most one of the most exciting questions, I think. Um, and it's because it's also completely wide open. I think there are you know, a number of theories that you know, papers being published about you know, grokking and how things uh, change over time. I do think that um, you know, there's also inspiration that one can draw from you know, physics. Uh, where emergence is something that has been studied, or um, you know, the emergence in kind of the life sciences. Um, one thing that um, is you know, we've been interested in is in context learning, which is one of the the kind of the pillars of uh, emergence behavior. You know, trying to understand how it, can you kind of replicate this in a much more uh, simple setting, right? Because if you train on web text. And you see in context learning, you don't really have a causal link between the data that generated uh, the behavior. Um, but we have some, um, you know, some theory and some you know, smaller experiments that show how in context learning can um, be represented and also can emerge from you know smaller scales. Um, and uh, you know, at, at like some you know one billion parameter. So not not in the kind of full general setting, but in sort of limited time toy setting. So, so I think the path of research I see is, you know, we scale up these models, we see these behaviors, and then we try to bring them into the lab and we study and understand, you know, the principles. Um, you know, one of the, we have a paper on showing how in context learning can be in, um, interpreted as sort of implicit Bayesian inference, where you have the, <laughs> the examples that um, form your kind of, and your, you inform your prior and then please, it's, it's please, please, please send that paper along. Okay, I'll, I'll send <laughs> okay. it. Okay, sounds so, I'll start so each I, I think there's things to do, but it's, yeah. it's still, you know, that is only one particular thing yeah. and it doesn't account for the full glory of the all the emergent properties, but it's a start. All right, well, everybody, thanks so much. We're at, at time. Uh, I know Erwin has to run across DC to get somewhere and we promised to meet 55 uh, or 11.55 his time. So thanks, Percy. Uh, Erwin, Sarab, and Ahmed for uh, an interesting, enlightening, and delightful conversation.